Lucy Beard. I'm the Executive Director at the Alice Paul Institute here on Tuesday, November 10th. I'm coming to you live from Paulsdale, alicepaul.org. Um, I'm going to assume that many of you know us. If you don't uh, and you have any questions, please write them into the chat. Um, this is the first of two programs we're doing this month in November. Um, the second one is next Saturday, November 21st at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we will be with, uh, oh, her name just went out, Jennifer Piscopo from Occidental College and Kelly Dittmars from Rutgers, Camden, and the Eagleton Institute for Women's Politics. And they will be talking about, guess what, that election we just had um, and women's role in the election, both as, as influencers, as voters, and candidates. Um, so it, we intentionally set it for two weeks after the election so that we would have time for the dust to settle. Um, but it will be a very interesting program, and I hope you'll join us for that. You can always find out about our events at alicepaul.org slash events and find out what's coming up. Uh, in the next month or two. Um, and we're enjoying our virtual programs that allow us to reach people from a distance. Um, it's, it's the one, as I keep saying, the one silver lining to this time when we're all shut down, that we're actually breaking the boundaries of geography and able to reach people all over the country with our programs. So that's a really the one nice aspect to all of this, but connecting with people across the country. Um, to date, we have reached people in every state in the country except for Wyoming. So we are waiting for our first attendee from Wyoming to join us. Um, I do want to introduce my co-presenter here, or my co-host, co Alyssa Hunt, who is the newly minted program director here at Paulsdale um, and is coming to you live from her home not far away from here in southern New Jersey. Um, and then I'll go on to, she'll help me with questions with Carol and just in, uh, in the conversation. But I'll go on to introduce the, the main event here is Carol Simon Levin. She is a storyteller, a historical impersonator. She's been a humanities scholar with the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Um, her specialty really is fascinating women history forgot. Women of all colors and creeds who fought for women's rights. Uh, she has a wonderful book, which we do sell here at Paulsdale, but I'm hoping she'll tell you more about how to get it directly from her uh, so that she gets all the proceeds. <laughs> and it's Remembering the Ladies from Patriots in Petticoats to Presidential Candidates. And it's a really cool, it's actually a coloring book, but it's got a lot more to it than, than coloring frames. And she worked with artists, but I'm going to let her tell you more about the book. Um, she is a retired librarian from Somerset County, and we're real happy to have her here with us today. We just wanted to talk to her. She's one of the most interesting con conversants I, I'm ever with. So I just wanted to get her on and just talk about what she's learning as she continues on this journey of uncovering uh, little known stories of women in our history and talk more in this centennial year about what it means. So Carol, welcome. Well, thank you so much. I am just tickled to be here. It's uh, definitely an interesting time uh, to be here, but at least, uh, you know, at least we see a light at the end of the tunnel, shall we just say. And um, yes, so uh, I am I, doubly honored or triply honored because I know that, Lucy, you are going to be retiring, so getting a chance to have this chat with you while you're still uh, well, I'm still official. <laughs> yeah, officially part of, of Paul Stale and the Alice Paul Institute is, is, a, is a, a special pleasure because Thanks. I have worked with you on a number of projects over the years and it's just been an absolute delight every time. I'm just going to interrupt briefly because I see that someone, uh, Lillian, has their hand up. Um, if you have any comments, since we don't have microphone capabilities for attendees, if you'll just drop them into that Q&A box and then Tane, who is managing um, behind the scenes for us, we'll be able to get those over to us. Great, thanks. So Carol, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started in women's history? What, what Okay, so. well, I it goes back a very, very long time um, to the 1970s when I was an undergraduate at Cornell, which is one of the few places around the country in those days that had a women's studies minor, a program. So I was doing history and economics, kind of social history, and I took as many courses as existed in the women's studies minor. So it was, it goes back a while. And then I uh, 
did my graduate work as a master's in library science, and I spent 32 years in librarianship. But uh, uh, five years in college and then 27 in children's librarianship. But 12 years ago, I was working out at Curves, which I call the ADD of exercise because <laughs> I get a chance to chat and, and work the muscles at the same time, work the jaws as well as every other. <laughs> and I was chatting with the woman at the, um, on the next piece of equipment, and she was wearing an um, underwater robotics t-shirt. And I have two daughters, both of whom have been always interested in STEM. So I got to talking to her. And it turned out that she, uh, her name, um, Carol Shields, she's a, uh, was at the time a um, history professor at Stevens Institute specializing in teaching K-12 to t uh, teachers how to teach um, STEM to kids. And she'd come across this fascinating woman who she figured was the first female engineer in the world, um, El, uh, Emily Roebling. And she said, had you ever heard of her? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I had just a couple months before been up in the Hudson Valley and stayed at a bed and breakfast called the Bird and Bottle Inn that is said to be haunted by, you know, ooh, Emily Roebling. So I knew her. The, the proprietress had talked about her. I'd yeah. seen a clipping about her. And um, to make a long story short, she said that she would love to find a picture book on her because she'd like to have that for teachers to introduce it to students, but she couldn't find one. And I said, well, I'm a children's librarian. Let me look into this. I can't believe it. Turned out there wasn't one. So I never had done this before in my life, but I, I wrote one, which still to this day never got a publisher. Over the course of the last eight years, Two very good ones have been published. But um, anyway, in, in doing the research, I got very into this character, thought she was wonderful, and nobody knew about her. And uh, so I started telling anybody I saw, I've never heard of her. And somebody who I knew said, well, you know what, you want to come and do a program about her? And I said, sure. And I started prepping it. And as I was prepping it, I remembered that in high school, I had done some theater. And I so as I was doing it, I said, do you want me to do it about her or as her? And they said, oh, come as her. So I wrote, scrounged up a, a costume and arranged to do that. And then one program led to another. And people said, hey, we had you this year. Can you do somebody else next year? And eight years later, eight programs later, I, I have gotten into it. But in 20, so the first few programs were on um, women in STEM, the uh, Bridge Builder and Petticoats, New Jersey's own, well, she's kind of arm wrestled between New York and New Jersey, uh, Emily Roebling, and then two on uh, women in aviation, and um, then Juliet Gordon Lowe, founder of the Girl Scouts. But then in 2016, we had what we thought was going to be a uh, groundbreaking election. And on June 8th, I know they date because it's my birthday. Uh, Hillary Clinton secured the nomination. And I'd been kind of thinking about it for a few weeks. And I said, you know what? I think we need, or I'm curious, you know, who are her antecedents? And so I started researching and writing. And in four months, uh, less than four months, about three months, I wrote 69 profiles and did a Kickstarter, found everybody who could take a pen to paper that I could find in the world, 36 different uh, artists in all, right. and created this book which was, of course, supposed to have a different ending. Because, of course, it was supposed to say, remembering the ladies from Patriots and Petticoats to President. President. Oh. Sigh. And then, you know, I had to do some rearrangement inside, too, because the, the build-up. Um, but it does. It has, uh, it, it profiles 69 women. I like to call them well-known and unknown, a third of whom are women of color. And when I first did the Kickstarter, I said, I think I'll have about 30 to 40 women. Well, I kept finding women. And had this year gone a little differently energy-wise and everything else, my goal this year was actually to publish a revised edition with 100 women uh, for the 100th anniversary. I have sort of started it, but COVID, everything else, I should have had more time, but I had less. So it just never did happen. Um, but, you know, it's... We've got the Grimke sisters, et cetera. And, um, but yeah, it, it and the sections, uh, just to give you a sense of how it was built, was the founding mothers, then abolitionists and suffragists, um, then advocates for worker, immigrant, women's and civil rights, then a women's places in the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, the State Department, and tribal government. And then the final one was the road to the White House, you know, Victoria Woodhull and uh, on. Um, for those who don't know, 1872, she ran for president. She didn't. When, of course, but she was she's the first one to run. And then other people along the way, including just a shout out to Margaret Chase Smith, who was the first woman to run on a um, 
on a major party ticket. She ran, uh, she ran for the nomination for the Republicans in 1964. And George Street right now has an incredible play called Conscience. Uh, one of the in interesting things about Margaret Chase Smith was she was the first person to stand up against McCarthyism in 1950, four years before he's taken yeah. out. And was she a, a member of the House at the time? She was a member of the Senate. She was already in the Senate. Okay. Um, yes, she would have had. No, no. That's a really good question. Um, Senate. Yeah, she was a member of the Senate because it was yeah. the, the Senate Committee on. Um, yeah. That's a really good question. I have to think about that for a moment. Um, but she's. Uh, yeah, she's incredible, and here she is, right there. Yeah. And um, I can. Let's see. She. I always see pictures of her. Wasn't she the one that had a pipe, smoked a pipe? Um, did she smoke a, smoke a pipe? <laughs> you know what? I've done so what much research on so many people, I can't remember anymore. <laughs> but I and that's not one of the fa fascinating factoids. I do put in <laughs> for every woman. Good. Said, no, you know who did Good. the pipe? No, the pipe is is New Jersey's own um, from Barnett Fenwick. Millicent no, Fenwick. Millicent no, Fenwick. Yeah, she's That's the right. pipe smoker. She's fabulous. Yeah, I'm I always so impressed by a woman with a pipe. <laughs> by the way, both of these women are in a wonderful book that's called um, Oh, uh, the No Stopping Us Now. Do you know about this? The Adventures of Older Women in American History. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's fabulous, yeah. and it does short profiles of a lot of just dynamite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. women who were middle ages and more um but anyway and the so yes yeah, there she is so uh she was elected to the senate i want to say in 50 in 49 47 okay. yeah 47 and so and she made this uh it was senator joseph mccarthy so she's already in the senate um but jumping back for one second and the reason i did the shout out is that right now um george street playhouse in, in March was going to do a, a, a program called Conscience, which was all about her and yes. Senator McCarthy. And then they ran it for four days before the election. And they've just, it's it's live right now. If um, at the end, if you're sending it out, I can send you a link, but um, they, it's a virtual program. They do it as a reading, but oh. um, but it's it's powerful. And, and, the, and you really see the courage involved, especially because nobody else, nobody else. I mean, if we're looking right now at courage right now in, the, in, in Congress, nobody else would stand up. She was solo. And the other interesting thing, as I said, as I always do these factoids, is it turns out she supported NASA and the space program. And the James Webb, Dr. James Webb, said without her in Congress, we never would have gotten a man to the moon. So oh you really owe a lot to Margaret Chase yeah. Smith. She's, she's just incredible. And I just love, isn't that a great image? Laura um, Lay Myers did it. And just a shout out to her. Mm -hmm. But just just incredible. And she ran for president uh, in, you know, uh, 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 Goldwater, Barry Goldwater got the nomination. But she ran. And oh. uh, just interesting, interesting. And then, of course, that's also the year that um, Lady Bird Johnson, who's also a magnificent figure, She's the one who actually ends up in the White House, admittedly on the distaff side. Um, but she's the first. She's one of the first really involved first ladies in legislation. Um, Head Start and so forth. And then later in life, here's a great factoid for her. She and Helen Hayes uh, co-founded the National Wildflower Research Center. It's in Texas, and yeah. um, of course, and um, but her her. She told it, a journalist the reason she did it was her way of paying rent for her time in this highly interesting world. It's one of my favorite lines of all time. Lady Bird Johnson said that? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I did a five-minute version of her for a program this summer, and you can find that one. Uh, anything about me, my uh, links to my book, where, and I, uh, et cetera, you can find on, on my website, which is tellingherstoriesplural.com. So it's super easy to remember. Yeah. But I have a link under my uh, on my uh, pro performances page to that to my impersonation i borrowed some pearls <laughs> i got a red jacket um yeah. put every plant i had in my on my in my garden and behind me in the um in the dining room to take the picture because i couldn't do it outside we were talking before about 
uh, Zoom having uh, noise suppression this summer, it didn't. And yeah, yeah. hear the traffic and the wind and stuff. So I had to do it inside, but she was such a plant lover that I had to make every flower I <laughs> so, could behind me. I have to ask, as a Texan, she's royalty. Um, you know, the blue moths are everywhere, and we, you all, like, you know, um, and I, I don't know if Tane feels the same way, who's also a Texan, but um, I grew up knowing like Lady, like the flowers were because of Lady Bird Johnson. Is that not calm? Is that not sort of common knowledge elsewhere in the country? I don't know. I, I have a friend who's a children's librarian and a program presenter for them um, who says everything she knows she learned from a children's book. And there's an incredible children's picture book called Lady Bird's Wildflowers, which I discovered 15 or 20 years ago when I've read to generations of children. And so that's how I knew about her. Um, but I don't know, Lucy, I don't know. Do you think she's widely known? I would say growing up on the, in the Northeast, um, no, I don't think she was considered royalty. <laughs> I, I, I think her Keep America Beautiful campaign is recognized rightfully as, I, I was very aware of it as a kid that the Keep America Beautiful campaign was her campaign. So she was really attached to it and that it made a difference. I grew up in the Keep America Beautiful generation. Yeah, the billboards to flowers. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I knew less about the wildflowers, but more about the don't litter. Don't you know, litter and yeah, yeah. And, and, and I mean that is, it was under her, under that campaign also that they banned billboards from yeah from national highways and right. started planting the um the yeah. edges whatever you call it with, with wildflowers but yeah there's this is by mm -hmm. tish wells there's lady bird right. right there um i feel like she's getting more um she's gained more gravitas with the years mm -hmm. the people mm -hmm. are recognizing more and more that she was pretty boss yeah I mean, that's no oh, sense. She was. i mean yeah. she stood up and called um the era the right thing to do almost yeah. a decade before it really it, yeah. it passed, but she was an advocate for it. Um, yeah. which is, of course, near and dear to the heart of Alice Paul. And that would have been, I bet they knew each other because, uh, you know, I Maybe. haven't looked at anything because she's yeah. calling it the right thing to do from her bully pu pulpit in mm -hmm. 64, 65. I don't remember what year it was, but mm -hmm. she's there from 60. Actually, she's there from 63 after the assassination yeah. to 68. And yeah. so sometime in that period, she you know, is speaking out in favor, uh, probably on multiple occasions, uh, of the ERA. And Alice Paul dies in 73? 72? 77. Uh, of course, right. Um, ERA gets passed in 72, 73, and then, yeah, and, and ra the ratification goes there. Yeah, so she's, uh, the, so they're both active on the ERA at the same time, so I can't imagine that they're right. uh, across at some point or another. I can imagine Alice Paul saying, yeah, but what does your husband think? <laughs> well, <laughs> and, yeah, I, and I can't remember where he stood. Um, yeah, but one of her other great lines was, um, what have you done for women today? That was her pillow talk. What? I talked about it in my program. Um, I'll see if I can find the exact quote, but, uh, and what have you done for women today? Now, Alyssa, did you grow up knowing her in that way? That she was a, a campaigner for women like that? No, just it was uh, not polluting and wild, like, yeah, in wildflowers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, what did you do for women today? I've got it as the opening quote here. Oh my gosh! Hello, talk. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Hello, husband. The world on your shoulders. What did you do for women today? But wow. yeah, start uh, civil rights. She's really up there. I, yeah. I, obviously, her husband had the political. You know yeah get things done uh although yeah. one of the unintended consequences although he recognized it was the uh democratic party flipped um you yeah. know the republican and the democratic parties really flipped because the southern democrats which were the conservative blue dog democrats fled right. the party over the civil rights uh, passage of the civil rights legislation and yeah. uh became yeah. So called to what I like to call the immoral minority um, in the 70s. <laughs> you don't know my politics, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, was I, actually, 
I have a question since you're talking about little known women from history. One yeah. of my favorite women from New Jersey history is Constance Cop. Do you talk about her anywhere? You know, I don't even know her. I'm sorry. Tell she me was the first. She was the first female sheriff in the United States. Really? Right around the turn of the century, she and her sisters, one of whom might have been her illegitimate daughter. There's, it's a little, it's a little murky um, about that, but they were, they lived in North, North Jersey. I don't, I don't remember where. Um, I want to say Union County, but it could have been further west. And they lived in this little town, and there was a big hoity-toity industrialist man, and they had their horse and cart, and he hit, he hit their cart with his car. And they said, well, you have to pay for this. And he said, I'm not going to pay for that. And he started terrorizing them. And someone was fi like fired a shot through the window of their farmhouse at night. So she went to the sheriff and said, I need, oh my um, you know, you don't have to do anything, but I need a gun because I have to protect myself. And ended up, they ended up kind of like surprising the sort of hired thugs of this industrialist man and taking them, taking him out and not killing him, but just like knocking him down and getting him arrested. And they won this suit against them and she became sheriff and maybe a Pinkerton. <laughs> See I love her. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is I know. I mean, that is it. I, I, there, there are so many <laughs> wonderful stories and uh, I definitely... Yeah. Uh, I've got several programs that I'm kind of starting to think about and uh, Reclaiming Our Voice, the one I do on New Jersey, is the first kind of Jersey-centric program I did mm -hmm. um, and that came about because I didn't know that the, the protagonist, I'll tell you about that in a minute, but there are so many wonderful unknown stories that I think that would be a real fun thing to do. So I hope that somebody can put the book that they just mentioned in chat and before we close that I can get that. But, yeah. but, um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm thrilled about that. And while I'm thinking about it, the other, this makes you think of the Wild West and we were talking about the, um, the uh, Wyoming being the only uh, state not yet represented. Right. And of course, what that's so interesting because Wyoming was the first mm -hmm. State, uh, territory actually mm -hmm. uh, to grant uh, women women suffrage and I I often say that women win suffrage but they didn't fight for it really in in Wyoming because it you, they right. didn't have to have a big fight for it there it, it we don't know all the details some of it's lost to history but it appears that it was actually pretty much pushed by men who mm -hmm. It was there's a six to one female rate male female ratio there. There were only a thousand women in all of the territory, mm -hmm. and they wanted women for two reasons. They wanted wives mm -hmm. um, to try to settle the place and not just be prostitutes. Essentially, they needed they needed females, and they wanted population. You needed a certain number of people mm -hmm. to apply for statehood, and again, you need wives to have babies, and you know mm -hmm. we all understand the mathematics there. So that you know that was the impetus and it's not clear that you know they thought maybe if we give women the vote we'll bring in more women you know come on in and but, interesting um, that they thought that yeah thought but the, what, the vote would be an incentive for women mm -hmm. and yeah. the other thing that we say you know not only did they win it and the territory the way it worked in a territory is the governor and the legislature could do it it didn't have to go to the citizens the all-male mm -hmm. electorate with, with a state the way it works is you have to run a resolution through uh, in New Jersey case, and I don't know how it works in every other state, but in New Jersey, two successive legislatures, and then it goes to the electorate, which is male, to, you know, let the dogs, let the cats in, essentially. Um, but that's, you know, that's how it worked there. But the, the, the sequel to it is it was 1869, so the same year that the 15th Amendment came out, uh, Wyoming did their, uh, you know, enfranchise their women. But when they became a state in 1890, they insisted on coming in with their women, that their their constitution not yeah. disenfranchise them, which was against the wishes of Congress. Congress was trying to get them to ditch them, and they said no. What's also interesting, there's a marvelous new book, and I meant to have it at, at my hand, and I forgot to. I see it over there by my, by my <laughs> stairs. Um, from the Smithsonian, it's called Smithsonian Women. And I just learned about the um, Hawaii and how Hawaii, of course, in the uh, late 18, in the late 19th century, the late 1800s, was ruled by a, a female queen. Queen, yeah. 
It had the highest literacy in the world, female uh, <laughs> general literacy. It had the highest, and it had female suffrage. Before, oh. everybody says um, that New Zealand is the first play, uh, yeah. country yeah. in the world. I guess Hawaii wasn't considered a country. I don't know. But we're, because yeah. I have to do more research, because I literally read this page about a, less than a week ago mm -hmm. in this book talking about the queen, they're invaded by the United States, the people who yeah. were, because we wanted the island for, um, as a base for the Spanish-American War. Yeah, yeah calling so Politically, and they disenfranchise the women. They, they throw her out, they put her under house arrest, and they disenfranchise the women. So the women of Hawaii since the 1840s or 50s had the vote and then lost it. I, uh, somebody's also said the Isle of Man is similar to that, but I haven't done the research yet. But, you know, these, these little interesting factoids, but it's a wonderful book. And uh, if somebody wanders through this hallway or can hear me elsewhere in the house, I'll have them bring it to me. But, or I'll just disappear from here. But anyway, back to something we talked about like 10 minutes ago, Unknown yeah. Women in New Jersey. So I was doing my program, Pickets and Persistence, War Service and Women's Suffrage, in which I portray Jeanette Rankin, the first female member of Congress from Wyoming's northern neighbor, Montana, which... Um, one, women won the vote in 1914, uh, and the campaign was spearheaded by Jeanette Rankin and others. And then she runs for uh, Congress uh, two years later. Uh, but I'm doing this program in Plainfield, and I'm not sure, there are a couple of candidates, I can't remember now who it was, whether, um, but anyway, uh, said, have you heard of Lillian Fecker? And uh, I said, Lillian who? And it turned out that Lillian was the head of the New Jersey women's suffrage from 1912 to 1920. And so I had kind of talked about New Jersey suffrage in my other programs as a little aside, the curiosity about uh, colonial, uh, early Republic suffrage, 18, uh, 1776 to 1807. And in the collective, the 1915 campaign by New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, New York, and Pennsylvania, uh, all of which failed. But I hadn't really dived into New Jersey. And so I started doing this and found that, my goodness, we, you know, it, it's a case just like today. Pennsylvania and New York get all the attention because we don't have a media market here. So much happened in New Jersey and nobody knows it. Uh, Vinland was this hot, hotbed of activism. It was um, halfway between Pennsylvania and, uh, sorry, Philadelphia and Atlantic City. And so much was going on there because it was so close to Philadelphia. Um, and so there's the Vinland voters in 19, uh, in 1872, 172 women, including four what were then called colored women, attempted to vote there. Lucy Stone is doing her activism. She's cutting her suffrage teeth. She legislative teeth. She had been lecturing on suffrage from 1849 or thereabouts mm -hmm. uh, onward all through the, um, on tour through most of the 1850s. But in, in the mid, in 1850s, in the mid 1850s, she and her sister-in-law, uh, her sis, her friend and, and uh, soon to be sister-in-law, Antoinette Brown, they both marry the Blackwell brothers. And they both, whose sisters, by the way, are those famous nurse, you know, the famous doctors, Elizabeth and Emily. It's quite a family. But um, <laughs> they marry Henry and Samuel, and they both eventually, 1856 thereabouts, move to New Jersey, 1856, 1857. And uh, uh, Lucy, by the way, keeps her maiden name. People who follow that are called Lucy Stoners. Mm -hmm. um, but she keeps her, she, they buy a house in Orange with her lecture earnings, a decade of her earnings. And when the tax man comes, she says no taxation without representation. He basically says no problem, impounds household goods, but it's kind of a setup. Other people who've been involved in the 1857 uh, uh, Women's Rights Conference, who happen to be her neighbors, buy them back. So it's clearly set up, but yeah. it's very well publicized, and and they get their stuff back. But they're, the the protest makes the national press, um, and then of course you've got the Civil War where a lot of the activism is tamped down because the women are sewing and filing and nursing and keeping homes, families, uh, farms, businesses going while the men are out warring. But then in 1866, things heat up again. Uh, the American Equal Suffrage Association is established. And Vinland, again, uh, becomes this this dyna, uh, dynamic 
place for it. It's the, uh, the 1868 election where they all vote. And who's coming down there? In addition to Lucy, who is making uh, Lucy and Antoinette, who are making uh, pilgrimages to Trenton to petition and actually, uh, in Lucy's case, address the legislature on behalf of women's suffrage and women's rights. This long, long, um, they have the transcript of what she said, and basically every argument that everybody, including Alice Paul, is going to make for the next 50 years, she's making in that address. I, I mean, it, it, it's it's like a crib sheet, you know, study this and you have every argument you need. Yeah. So she's doing that, and then the next two years, she and Antoinette send petitions for this to the legislature, all of which is, is mocked you know they say ever since eden you know women's women women's sin in eden guarantees them the subordinate position in home and and uh society but um and if you don't know the how to recognize a fish a, a particular fish you're not eligible to vote i mean that's the mockery that's a level of mockery there but um you know she's she's cutting her legislative teeth here Lucy Stone, we yeah. all think of her involved because in 1870, she'll head up to Boston and she'll stay there the rest of the time. And that's where most of the issues of, of, of the Women's Journal, her magazine, are published. But and, She did um, not come back her, to New Jersey after that? No. Oh. Well, I don't know if she came occasionally, but she was not very yeah, well. After the birth of Alice, she actually was sick a lot of the time. So yeah. um, her husband helped with, um, you know, Henry uh, Blackwell helped with the journal. And then as Alice grew up, uh, her Alice, not Alice Paul, yeah. Alice, yeah. Brown Blackwell, uh, Alice Stone Blackwell. Um, she, uh, you know, they took over the family business, which was Women's Journal, which was the longest lasting uh, because... Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony's journal, uh, newspaper journal, whatever, the revolution only lasted two years. They both started okay. about the same time. And then, yeah. of course, um, in, the, uh, in 1913, Alice Paul's The Suffragist will, will, kind of help, will start yeah. being published. But yeah, no, it was always published up there. She's always up there. And she and the well stayed here. doing the touring after Alice yeah. was born. I, I understand she was not terribly well and just didn't yeah. have that stamina anymore. And, and Antoinette and her husband stayed in New Jersey, didn't Antoinette they? Antoinette and her husband stay in New Jersey. And in fact, Antoinette is the, when you read national reports of Seneca mm -hmm. Falls and the history of the movement, they a lot of them end with, and the only woman who was right. at Seneca Falls who, um, uh, you know, who lived long enough to see the vote was mm -hmm. uh, Charlotte Woodall. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Wood, 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 Woodward, sorry, it's Victoria mm -hmm. Wood, Woodall. Uh, Char Charlotte Woodward, who was um, a 19-year-old seamstress at at um, Seneca Falls and a 91-year-old, but she, mm -hmm. there's no evidence she actually voted, at least then. She may have voted in 1917 because that's when New York won it and she was right. not. But she was too ill to cast her vote in 1920. Yeah. Um, we, but we have no, we don't know. But we do know, because we have a newspaper account, that um, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, who was at the first national convention, which was held in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1850, she was a 95-year-old great-grandmother living in Elizabeth, and she cast a vote right. in the 2020 election. So she's the only, she's, she was considered the pioneer suffragist because she's the, she outlived all the other activists. It's not clear that Charlotte would word was an act a suffrage activist i've never right. seen anything i mean she just has the footnote the interesting footnote in history the fascinating factoid right. that she was you know she was her lifetime encompassed that but it's funny that she is in the national you know all the national things and it was not until i started looking at new jersey stuff that i heard the story of antoinette brown blackwell who actually right. did encompass after right. all the other women died you know every, she she was a minister right she was, she she was the first minister? female it started congregationalist then uh turned to unitarian uh ministered a couple uh yes uh yeah. different congregations and yes she was a female mil uh, minister and the first female ordained minister of a what do they call it regular religion you know mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I, they, they i guess it, because of the whole issue is you might have had some female centric you know uh, yeah. Right. But, but yeah, so she uh, and she and uh, Lucy had met at Oberlin uh, in the late 1840s when both were studying the uh, they were both studying Greek and Latin. And the reason they were studying Greek and Latin is the ministers used the Bible to justify women's 
Mm -hmm. limits on women's participation. They said that right. um, women were promiscuous. I was speaking before promiscuous audiences, which in those days meant mixed male and female. It, it sounds so much more exciting than it was. <laughs> but um, yeah, they, they met at Oberlin. They were studying Greek and Latin because the minister said that the Bible said that women were forbidden from speaking out in public. And they found that the uh, the original language is uh, correctly translated, said that women were prohibited from idle chatter in church. A little bit different. And so, yes, but Lucy's not al allowed to give the commencement speech because it would have been before a, a um, promiscuous audience. So instead she went on the road for like eight years and was speaking out on abolition, temperance and, and women's rights. And as you know, Antoinette would speak from the pulpit. So, yeah. yeah. Interesting women, very interesting women, but they're, yeah, they're nationally known people, but nobody associates them with New Jersey. So mm -hmm. that was really interesting. And then, of course, Alice Paul, uh, although, born and bred in, in New Jersey, although she spent most of her time in Washington, D.C. when she was mm -hmm. active in the movement. But, mm -hmm. And then women from New Jersey um, who got very involved in the movement, including um, uh, Terrell, um, She's, I'm sorry, she's national, but comes to New Jersey for the 1915 campaign speaking on it. And uh, Reverend Florence Spearing Randolph, who, um, an interesting little side thing, as the movement gets more activist, which is what Alice Paul is advocating, um, basically until around 1909, women's rights is, uh, the activism is parlor activism. It's it's middle and upper class women who are having mm -hmm. meetings with like-minded women who are um, who are advocating, but it's not getting out into the streets. You're not having parades, you're not having public speaking and so forth. And then uh, 1909, you've got, a, uh, that, that starts even maybe a wee bit earlier with uh, 1908, you've got Harriet Stanton Blatch, the daughter of the, uh, of uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who gets active in, in New York, uh, Mina Van Winkle, who's doing a parallel organization, uh, working women organization um, in New Jersey, and they're bringing working women. And that's the, these are the women who are going on strike. You're getting a lot of that kind of activism, and it's bringing in the middle and upper class, the college women, the working women, all into this movement, and it's going out into the streets, which alarms the former um, suffrage supporters in the women's movement, the women's club movement, which had joined in for suffrage because they saw it as a way of having social good. If you had a vote, you could make sure you had uh, money for schools and you would have money yeah. for libraries and, uh, you know, safe streets and all the, and temperance, uh, which was the other big organization, the temperance movement. But anyway, the white women's club movement pulled out of the, uh, both nationally and in New Jersey in 1910. They stopped supporting it at the, at an official level. There might have been still support by some women in the movement, in the clubs, but they as a group pulled out. Interestingly enough, though, in New Jersey, and I think it's parallel nationally, although I haven't studied it, um, there had been, within the Women's Christian Temperance Union, there had been segregated black clubs. Black, yeah. black yeah. WCTU chapters. Chapters, there we go. Oh, yeah. And um, the segregated black chapters are um, unified by, in New Jersey, by Florence Spearing Randolph into the New Jersey Colored Women's Clubs. Okay. And they support, they are very active. They, they support Lillian Feckert and the other people working on the 1915 campaign and then later on on the ratification of the 19th Amendment. They come on board long before the women's clubs come back. On a national basis, the women's club come, comes come back in 1915. So the New York women's clubs are helping at the 1915 campaign, not in New Jersey. They are not on board for our 1915 state res uh, re uh, uh, resolution. Yeah. They only come back in 1917. So they're there for the the national campaign there, but not. Yeah. So you know, there's so many schisms over the years. You've got the first one oh, um, between uh, Lucy Stone, Antoinette, their husbands, a bunch of other people um, uh, who formed the American Women's Suffrage Association mm -hmm. in, in um, uh, eight, 
1869, at the same time, the National Women's Suffrage Association is formed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and the split is over support for the 14th and 15th Amendment mm -hmm. um, right. and strategy, uh, you know, and, and bitterness because yeah. um, Frederick Douglass had been a vocal supporter in 1848 of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's very controversial uh, stance on and this one of the resolutions at the Seneca mm -hmm. Falls was on voting. And it was everything else that was there, you know, which custody of children, retention of your earnings, retention of property brought into marriage, uh, educational opportunities for women, all of those were like no brainers. Everybody was behind them. But the vote was very controversial. In fact, Lucretia Mott, the co organizer with Elizabeth of the Seneca Falls Convention, turned to, Liz uh, to Elizabeth and said, Lizzie, thee will make us ridiculous. But Frederick Douglass said, no, you know, without the vote, you can't get anything else. But Fred mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass knew, you know, that there's the old saying, the two things you never want to watch being made are, so are sausage and legislation. <laughs> and Fred Frederick, I think it's Mark Twain, but I'm not positive. Uh, Frederick Douglass mm -hmm. said, um, you know, we, there, we don't even, you know, from a, uh, after the Civil War, women are down in D.C. all the time lobbying Congress to get universal suffrage, universal rights um, in those 14th and 15th Amendments, but it's black, black male only. And, um, and so there's a lot of bitterness. As I said, Frederick Douglass is a realist. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony's aren't well, you know, they're not willing to concede that. They're really angry about what they regard as a betrayal after two decades of support for abolition and support for the, for them to see them go away, even though, as I said, realistically, there wasn't a possibility of getting it. They 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 were mad about it. And, and I think they were also angry because biology trumped, and, and sometimes people charge them with being racist, but, you know, an anti-immigrant, but biology trumped any understanding of the ballot. You know, they say, you know, black men are doing it and women, educated women can't. And we talk about that as being sexist and classist. But think about it for a minute. If you can't read or speak English or write, and you are, are casting a ballot, then you are very much subject to corruption. I mean, you could easily be bought. Because, and, and in fact, we have proof that in some places uh, in the 1915 election, saloons handed out, bars handed out tickets good for two drinks if what women's suffrage is defeated. Well, you know, if you don't even read the ballot and you know that if you just, if you're told if you put in your ballot with the X on the lower, the lower X, we're going to give you two beers. So... That's very frustrating that women yeah. couldn't do that. And we'd seen that in New Jersey here even before that because there was a hard fought election in uh, 1894 for, for school suffrage. I mean, holy moly, Can, people, women have children. Shouldn't they be able to have some say in how education is done in their community? And some women had had it briefly. It's a whole nother story in 1887, um, the, the legislature unanimously passed rural school suffrage. So only in rural, not in cities. And it's they, they have some suspicion it might have been a deal between temperance, male temperance advocates and um, and the urban bosses. Okay, we'll give you that. You stay out of our territory. But then in uh, the 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 uh, then it's then it's ruled unconstitutional by the state constitution. Something over a whole different. It was election of traffic commissioners or something. But it it brought it back because women couldn't vote. It, it was decided because our 1875 constitution only enfranchised black males. Women can't vote for for people. They could vote for budgets, but not for people. Mm -hmm. So that energizes, initially energizes the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association to try to, for full suffrage. And then they realized there's no dice. You know, within very few uh, months, they realized they don't have the votes in Trenton to get full suffrage. So they say, well, maybe let's just get full school suffrage all across the state. And they, you have to pass it through, through two legislatures and then send it to the electorate, the male electorate. And everybody seems to be supporting it. The churches, you know, the teachers, the letter carriers everybody seems to be supporting it except the urban bosses and they're able to buy enough votes so that it's soundly defeated 58 to 42 percent um 
is soundly defeated in uh, no, I'm sorry, 1915, but it's soundly defeated school suffrage. So they're, they know, you know, they are speaking from truth because they're not, you know, that many people who, it, it seemed like they had it in the bag. It's school suffrage. So this, this is, this is speaking from experience, this, this feeling of, uh, so we, we often, we often call things racism and classism, which are just realism in a way that, that in, this mm. is Tammany Hall, you know, if, if, if you don't have an educated electorate, then you have to worry about how they are going to, what's going to govern their vote. And right. it's ugly. It's not pretty. I'm not defending it in any way, but I can understand it. Right. Where they're right. Coming from. And it is, it is, it's, it's very problematic. And it is, you know, we have a very messy history of who we enfranchise and who we choose not to. Yeah. Hmm. Alyssa, I sensed that you had a question that you wanted to ask. Well, there, I've got a couple. Uh, <laughs> so we've been talking about a lot. I actually uh, have just a, sort of a random aside. You were talking about Lucy Sin and Antoinette Blackwell. Mm -hmm. Overland in the 1840s. I have, I think she's my fourth great aunt. Her name was Betsy Mix Coles. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. But she was the president, she was at Oberlin in the 40s, and she was president of the Ohio Women's Convention. And oh, wow. stayed at our family homestead that's still in the family in Ashtabula County, Ohio. And my cousin, Virginia Seifer, who, who, who Jenny's probably 80, but she is does historical reenactment as Betsy. That's fabulous. I hope she's done a, a um, oral history as well that you guys have captured so you have all of that information. We've got, you know, the house is, um, it's a... It's a historic landmark in the state and all of Betsy's papers are at Kent State in Ohio, but that's, um, there's, you can see the, oh, sorry, you can see the sliding panels where um, escaped enslaved people would hide in the house when they were heading up, heading up to Canada because it's right by the lake, but um, there's just, there's so many women, it just makes me think about how many women um, didn't have the, didn't have any publicity around them because of the people who not just controlled the votes but controlled the public narrative which determined who got the vote and just how much work women have been doing on all fronts of social justice and for equality and advocacy throughout i mean earlier when you were mentioned abigail adams who i see as you know, sort of the mother of the american women's movement um, yeah. but most uh, but most people don't know about those letters that she wrote I, I'm going to use that as a segue for a moment to do a, a promo for if anybody is in the Philadelphia area, the Museum of the American Revolution has an exhibit going on right now when women lost the vote about the fact that from 1776, three months after uh, Abigail Adams' famous letter to her husband with the threat, if sufficient remember the ladies if sufficient care and attention is not paid to the ladies we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation which is exactly of course what the uh, the delegates to the, of the convention were saying to king george but he replies she's so saucy and later worries that you know that everybody is rebelling against them and another tribe more numerous than the others the women are going to start demanding their rights as well. Those letters, by the way, are in Philadelphia right now for the first time since they were written yeah. 244 yeah. years ago. The originals are back at this museum, which is really cool to see. Yeah. As are, um, some people think that our, uh, three months after that letter, you know, uh, New Jersey passed a provincial constitution on July 2nd, 1776, with, um, Georgia, with uh, the, the British on, literally on our doorstep but um, that enfranchised all inhabitants worth 50 pounds proclamation money, uh, not all white male inhabitants, which was pretty much what all the other colonies were saying. So um, it implicitly enfranchised some women and African-Americans and aliens. But um, anyway, so that's what this exhibit is about because it's about the that period um, from 1776, kind of realistically because of the war and stuff, we didn't start having real elections probably until uh, the late 1780s, uh, 17, 1780s. But from there till, uh, till 1807 uh, in New Jersey, uh, women had the vote. And 
it's a wonderful exhibit and not only is it a wonderful exhibit but because they did the exhibit they have uncovered a whole they did a lot of research they've got you know the curators scurrying around new jersey looking i probably they were at, i don't know if they were at alice fall but um they uncovered uh real poll books from around the state yeah. Uh, yeah, which had not been discovered before, um, because it had been anecdotal evidence. People, mm -hmm. in fact, um, some people accused, uh, you know, a politician said ten thousand voters, and and um, some sources quoted that, and other scholarly sources said, no, 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 that's just political hyperbole. But if you think of now about what the level of population was in the state and the fact. Mm -hmm. Around 8% of the voters turn out to be female names on the surviving records. That's not, un, you know, that that's within the, the, the realm of possibility, the 10,000 voters, female voters. Anyway, all is which to say that they now have proof. And uh, and that's really cool. And it's a great exhibit. So I will, right. I, I suggest it, it highly if anybody has a chance. It'll be there through sometime in April at the museum. And that's the Museum of the American, American Revolution. Revolution in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah but we yeah. did talk to them during the planning phase yeah yeah well and it what happens i mean there's a lot it's a very complicated story on how women lost the vote that it's mm -hmm. political parties happen and there's a lot of division back and forth and things like that but what is used as the excuse whether it's just kind of the the final bowling pin um is that uh, in the there's a an election in Essex County in in early 1807 about where to put a courthouse, and um, people vote the, the 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 losing side charges that some pe men dressed as women and voted multiple times, but instead of prosecuting the election stealing cross dressers, they um, the all male okay. legislature passes a law to regularize the electorate and. Um, to uh, to white male inhabitants were thinking, mm -hmm. you know, of twenty of, of legal age twenty one, um, and and so they lose it, um, which is incidentally an illegal law. You cannot actually amend a constitution with a law, but unless somebody fights it in court, nothing happens, and nobody did. And then the eighteen forty four revision to our constitution put in that uh, that that law into statute. I mean, into the constitution. And uh, so that regularized it. But um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who lives, again, another woman who we uh, think of as being New York. She's only in Seneca Falls a few years. She's in Tenafly, New Jersey from 1868 to the mid-1880s. Mid she eventually goes yeah. abroad to be with her, her daughter. I'm not sure when the house is actually sold. Yeah. But um, in 1880, she tries to vote in Tenafly and and uses the justification that the Constitution that eliminated women's rights to vote was unconstitutional because mm. only men voted for the people in the legislature to do that because in 1807 women had not been able to vote. So the 1844 legis legislature is an, is an all female, uh, I mean an all male was elected, yeah. so, so it's all illegal, which is an um, argument that's actually made before the New Jersey Supreme Court by, oh, I'm going to forget her name, the one, the first new female lawyer in New Jersey, um, and very active in Douglas College, and I'm going to, I can't remember her name right now, but she, um, she makes that very argument in 1911, and it's knocked down in 1912, but saying, you know, 1844 is Constitution's amendment is illegal because of who voted for it, um, but and she doesn't win. I assume she does not win, which is why we then that was sort of the legal channel to trying to get women's suffrage back in New Jersey. But when that at the same time that that fails in court, um, we've already introduced the um, the referenda for the first time in the New Jersey legislature, which will culminate after, turns out to have three, have to go through three sessions um, of getting passed through the New Jersey legislature before it's um, it goes to the electorate because of dirty tricks, no surprise, right? <laughs> New Jersey has always had that, but um, the way it worked was um, in 1912, it fails through both houses the first time they bring it through. In 1913 though, they do get it through both 
both chambers of our legislature by convincing the legislature they're not voting for women's suffrage. They're voting to allow the all male electorate of New Jersey to decide. So it goes through, but then after it passes in the spring of 1913, um, they're doing a lot of publicity for the second campaign. And the, the law of New Jersey is that it has, the text of the resolution has to be published in newspapers all across the state in the summer, uh, at least three months before the election so that people, when they are doing, electing their legislators can ask them how they stand on a particular law, uh, a constitutional amendment. and Oh, an oversight, says the government. You know, they fail to do that. And by the time a newspaper editor points it out to the women and they rush to Trenton, including Lillian Feckert, um, it's too late. And, you know, they know it's a dirty trick and they're furious about it, but they've been outsmarted. And uh, so they have to reintroduce it in 1914. Again, it easily passes there. And then they discover, well, then it's it, uh, the legislature, oops, fails to publish it in the Senate journal. But this time, when the women have learned the ins and outs and they find out in time and they get them to publish the errata and then it's it's introduced as the first bill in the in the 1915 uh session and passed again and then it goes to the electorate and you know after essentially four years of campaigning massive campaigning and then campaigning that year which has um one and a half million pieces of propaganda are, are published are, are printed if you just imagine i mean they I, I haven't actually looked up what the population is but we're only nine million now so you know well yeah. over a, a piece of pop, uh, a propaganda per per capita i think um and a suffrage a torch that's passed from new jersey yeah. from new york to new jersey there's a liberty bell that's going on in pennsylvania there's a suffrage camel which i have only seen right. But I have absolutely no idea why a suffrage camel, <laughs> beast of burden sort of thing on it. But, you know, I've never seen any, right. if anybody has any information of the history behind the suffrage camel, I would surely, I, I would very, I have an image of it and that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I know it toured the state and it had propaganda on it, but why a camel? You know, in New Jersey, yeah. it's yeah. not like it's a native creature um but it's it bigger than an aardvark that's why yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You know, a deer we, do, yeah. we have a traveling exhibit here that um organizations can borrow that is all about the amazing ways that they did promote the suffrage campaign in new jersey with really unique branding and marketing and publicity efforts um road rallies and all kinds of things. And um, anyone who's interested in that, just give us a call at the Alice Paul Institute. And we are lending it out to libraries and other public venues where more people can see it. Um, it's a, the suffrage story doesn't end at the end of 2020. We're going to keep talking about it. And, uh, keep it's a great I, 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 a shout out to it. It's a wonderful display. It's it's the one you've got that there are panels, right? Right, right. It, yes. So it's portable yeah. and then it you pull right. up pull high panels, panels or whatever. Yes, it's oh, if, you're, if you're near Mount Laurel, well, we still have a few nice days left. You can walk around the porch at Paulsdale and see it in all of our big, gorgeous French windows. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But we are at an hour and I could sit and listen to you all night, but at some point you're going to run out of steam. This has been fascinating. <laughs> it's been a delight. And if you ever want me, you know, to oh, we do. come back, I, I'd be delighted. There's so many wonderful, wonderful stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, please keep telling them and writing them down. And well, thank you. Yeah. Um, a shout out for that, by the way. Um, I wrote uh, the Garden State Legacy, which is an, right. an online history magazine for New Jersey. A shout out there, by the way, the editor Gordon Bond is retiring from editing. It'll stay up, but if anybody has the energy to take it over, it's really sad to think it's coming to an end. But our March 2020 issue, he and I co-edited, and I thought I was writing the introductory article and then several people bowed out, and whatever. Yeah, I so I lot. ended up writing a 60 page article for this, yeah. mostly a, almost a book. Yeah, called reclaiming our voice, and it it 
talks about lots of the stuff that we talked about today. It's available for free online. Uh, at, uh, there's a link right at tellingherstories.com. And that, that issue also has an article on the anti-suffrage movement, which was very strong in New Jersey. The right. people, uh, the immigrants, the uh, Jewish suffragists, the uh, women of color involved in the movement. That's another article. I think it's Suffrage for All is the title on that one. Um, and then one on the suffrage torch and one on uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's attempt to vote in Tenafly. Some amazing poems by Susanna Rich, uh, who many of you I hope heard when she did her program at API. Um, and I'm forgetting... Oh, petticoat electors, right? The the right. right. Um, yeah. So all of those are in there, and um, it's all accessible. And it's a a long link if you go directly to the issue. But if you just go to my website, tellingherstories.com, you'll see a picture of the in issue, and there's a link right there. Right. There's also, a link I spoke on all of it, the WNYC program, on literally the day New York shut down. I was in New York City when they closed Broadway for the COVID. It was the yeah. last program I did. Unfortunately, I did not bring COVID out with me, the coronavirus <laughs> out with me on the subway, on New Jersey. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, what is it, the 10th, I think, of, of March. But you yeah. can, if you search all of it, again, you don't have to go to all of it because right below it, I, I put a link. So, and I also put a link to various other things. And, um, there are lots and lots uh, of links yeah. to, the, to the suffrage movement in New Jersey, to Alice Paul Institute. And I am compiling at the moment, all summer long, when everybody was doing their webinars, I was compiling a list of a, a, a worksheet for all my friends who were into all of this and to me, for me personally to keep track of everybody's webinars. Um, which now have lots of dead links because they were links to registration for webinars. But many yeah. of them are recorded. And now that the election is over and I'm not writing postcards and texting and phoning uh, 12 hours a day or whatever it was, I one of my tasks for this month is to clean up that document with, with, with permalinks to all okay. the webinars that are still up there that I can That's great. Yeah, that's, so, a, that's a really um, that, The link to that is at the top. So that is to say that it's kind of messy right now. It's a, it's yeah. a, a really messy document, but um, hopefully by the end of November, it'll be a nice clean document. And speaking of the end of November, the uh, Museum of the American Revolution is promising a virtual exhibit to go up okay. the end of yeah. So if you can't get there, if you're coming from Wyoming <laughs> uh, or anywhere else around the country and um, can't get to the museum, they should have something coming up there, too. They're promising right. it soon. And speaking of virtual exhibits, a shout out to the wonderful virtual exhibit, um, which I was watching, uh, going through today, scrolling through at Alice Paul. And I don't know if you guys want to throw a, a link into the um to the chat for that for everybody yeah. as well. i haven't seen it it's it's in mosaic it's in the latest mosaic the link mm -hmm. i clicked on it and i was very impressed so oh just, thank you that was done by Tane. the the there black, you go, Tane. black square on the on the on the so, screen you did a great shout job. Out for that because it is a great job and mm -hmm. and it, it's about uh, primarily about the hunger strikers and the, right, and the time for, in jail the time in jail and and at a time right now where there's so much rhetoric about everything old is new again. We're dealing with <laughs> the same kind of thing of, of uh, accusations that these perfectly peaceful marchers are, right. Um, right. you know, up to no good. And it's it, it's right. really rather terrifying. And, when, uh, and of course, it was the people. ruling by the court in March of, of 1918 for mm -hmm. the um, for the women who had been um, this silent sentinels, Alice Paul's National Women's Party mm -hmm. silent sentinels, these, these picketers, these perfectly peaceful picketers who were picketing the White House, who were arrested for obstructing um, sidewalk traffic and brutalized. It was the court ruling that said that the mere act of assembly is not illegal unless it's for an illegal purpose that is this is the reason that I I live near Bedminster? I live in Bedminster. I live near um, Trump's uh, golf course here. Yeah. And for many uh, many weeks this year, we had been going out on Sunday morning to uh, protest, you know, mm -hmm. for democracy. Uh, right. That the uh, other side had been out there on Saturdays, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then when they found we were doing Sundays, they came out and shout out shouted us. It was interesting, but the legal. Mm -hmm 
basis of that is um, was was from the brut emerged from the brutality uh, of the imprisonment of of Alice Paul and her, right. her women's mm -hmm. national women's party volunteers. We have to know our history to understand yeah. our present exactly. and to plan for our future. That's all Speaking there is of Alice Paul, we talked about this before, but everybody should know this is a reproduction of Alice Paul's flag. I don't know if. If it's exactly this way or not, because I don't know if we have yeah. color. We don't. We don't have a color rendition of it. We only have the black and white photos, right? right. In fact, right, right there. And if anybody ever finds it in an attic, it's missing. Yeah. And I know the institute would love to have it. It disappeared. Do you know what year it disappeared? No, no. I believe it was cut up and people were given pieces, but I'm That's not. Years. I'm not positive. Yeah. But, all to say thank you thank you very much Alyssa. did you have anything you wanted to say to close no. thanks for it's joining us pleasure carol thank you well i have a question for you as alice paul institute and that is that yeah. they usually call these colors gold white and purple mm -hmm. but i've seen in one place that they talk about them as gold white and violet give women the vote <laughs> very That's <clever. laughs> a post you know, is this an after effect? Have you seen it in any writings, a discussion of it? I mean, it, it's inherited from um, uh, from Britain because it was the right. green she brought the purple white from Britain. and purple in right. Britain. So if it had, if it was the violet there as well, but I don't know, does she refer to it as purple all the time? I have always seen it as purple, but now that you say that, the green, white, and violet I've seen in England forget out the vote. I have seen that as an English thing, but not, but an, not American an American I can think of. Well, good. Thank you. Because it's been something I, I tried to yeah. do a little bit of research, but, you know, didn't have the time to take the deep dive I needed to right, find. Right. And I hadn't been able to find any verification of that. So that's great. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. And something tells me you'll get to that at some point. <laughs> well, there's, you Foster. know, I, I, I consider myself that. like a, um, uh, you know, in the, the elephant with my satiable curiosity. Uh, <laughs> Good. Always Good interested in other things. And I would love to have the information from Elisa on that interesting sheriff story. So please send that to me. All You're right. Welcome. We will. You've got a deal. Yes. Thanks very much, Carol. And thank you to everyone who attended tonight. I can see in the, in the chat that people really enjoyed this. So. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, oh wait, by wait. the way, um, speaking yeah. of, I, I mentioned the access to the, um, yes. to the magazine article, but you were asking how to get this. There are two right. ways. Again, at Telling Her Stories, there is a link. When COVID came up, I had a hundred of these, you know, in my in my house that I was going to be taking around because I had 47 reclaiming our votes right. programs already. 80, 80 plus for the uh, of all my yeah. programs this year, but over 40 uh, uh, of this one before COVID. So I had all these books. But um, when COVID came, I said I don't want anybody. So many people are 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 dealing with uh, financial hardship. They're home home teaching, etc. So I ended up putting an ebook version of this free of charge on my website, which means anybody has access to the book. If you're just looking at pages or reading online or want to print off individual pages, that you're, you're more than welcome. And if you have a Girl Scout troop and you want to do all, you know, everybody learn about a person that week or whatever, you can do, you know, have everybody print out pages. That's absolutely fine. If you're planning to print out the whole book, it is far cheaper to buy it because your ink <laughs> costs are going to be more. Um, and that you can do, there's a link to the purchasing of that. Okay. But um, I, you know, tellingherstories.com. Tellingherstories.com. Right. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. And finally, at tellingherstories.com is a link to my email. So if I was too chatty tonight and I didn't get to a question you had, or if you think of one tonight at two in the morning when you wake up, yeah. um, Look for me, send me uh, information. And if you didn't get to see my program beforehand or any of my programs, uh, there are links to my programs. Many of them are on Zoom, so it doesn't matter whether I'm talking to a group in LA or you know, yeah. in, in, in Moorestown. Um, you can attend anywhere in the country. And I, some of them are recorded and also the links are there. So you can Great. see them at your leisure um, and attend those programs and, and then get back to me if I if you have questions from them as well. Oh, thank you. We'll be in touch soon and well, uh, keep on keeping uh, on, Kate. Uh, uh, Kane, it's just been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me and um, best wishes uh, as this thank year you, goes. Thank you, Carol. Be well. Be well. Sandy, be well. Uh, stay, everyone stay well. 
keep in touch, alicepaul.org. Our next program is November 21st. And then we'll, we're coming up with our, our December offerings. But thank you very much for being a part of this evening to all of you. Good night. Good night.